Welcome to today's broadcast of North Idaho College Public Forum. The crew is comprised of NIC television students and your moderator is North Idaho College political scientist Tony Stewart. It is a special privilege today for us to welcome to our program Richard H. Stallings, the congressman from the 2nd District of Idaho. The Honorable Richard Stallings is a Democrat from the 2nd District. He was ele first elected in 1984 and he was re-elected in 1986, now serving his second term uh, from the eastern Idaho and parts of uh, uh, Boise, Idaho. Congressman Stallings serves on the Agriculture, Science and Technology, and the Select Aging Committees of the United States House of Representatives. Prior to going to the Congress, uh, Congressman Stallings was a professor of history at Ricks College where he taught for uh, a number of years. So he has an outstanding background uh, in academic matters in the history before he became a member of the United States House of Representatives. Congressman Stallings, we wanted to have you on this program for a long time and we thank you for taking time out from your schedule as you're uh, representing the Congress at a congressional hearing to be with us today. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. And I'm very happy to welcome to the program to question our guests, three panel members today. Uh, first of all is Idaho State Senator Mary Lou Reed, and next to her is Dean Steve Schink, who is Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College, and for the first time, Patrick Riley from Boise, Idaho, a student at North Idaho College and president of the student body. And I shall invite Mary Lou Reed to commence the questioning. Thank you, Tony. Congressman, many of us are waiting with somewhat bated breath to see the outcome of the Idaho Wilderness Bill. Are you going to give us a few sneak previews here? And is that a fair question? Well, that's a tough question for me. Uh, the problem, really, is in North Idaho. My district, the second district of Idaho, the wilderness issue is very easily solved. In fact, we've looked very closely at a number of areas. Uh, there's essentially unanimous agreement on it. I don't think there's going to be much of a, much of a fight. It's how we resolve the North Idaho question. In fact, I mentioned to one of the members of the delegation that we could write a bill for the second district of Idaho and have this thing resolved. Uh, I know that the governor and Senator McClure are working on this. They're going to put together a package. I personally have stayed out of this battle because, of course, my district ends at Boise and at Chalice and Limhi counties. And uh, I really would be a little presumptuous to come up here and tell Congressman Craig and the, the senators what would be the best for this area. And yet I felt that it takes a statewide official to put together that package, and so I've tried to work with the governor. We, like I say, we've made recommendations of the second district. I've listened to some folks from the first district about some areas they're interested in. I'm hopeful that uh, a package will be forthcoming, that we will get this together. As it is, Idaho now is in the worst of all situations. Since the federal judge determined that until a state has a wilderness bill, the Forest Service must treat all of its potential wilderness land as if it were wilderness, means that Idaho is now at about 9 million additional acres of, of roadless wilderness. I think that if we could put together a wilderness bill, it would reduce that, release a lot of that land for logging or for whatever it is best suited for, and we could get on with the development of our resources in this state. But uh, How much time do you suppose we have to wait either to see it or to see some action on it? In the well, I, I understand that uh, the governor and the senator have been meeting, that they've been involved in some negotiations. Like I said, I've made some recommendations for the second district, and I would be very interested to see the package they put together. I have said long and a long time ago that I wasn't going to get involved in a big uh, spitting match over this, that if uh, we can put together a package that the entire delegation will agree on, then I will be happy to carry it in the Congress. And uh, I think we can pass it. I think we could do it in this next year. Uh, if there is a lot of dispute and a lot of fights and this environmental group or that industri industry group decides to oppose it and to fight with it, then uh, I would think that we'll have some trouble. So first of all, we have to see the final package that the senator and the governor agree on and then uh, see how that, what, how that will uh, suit those parties that are most interested. And if we can get general agreement, we'll never get universal agreement, Mary Lou, you know that in your business in the legislature, but uh, if we can get a, a majority of people agreeing, then I think it's very doable this next session. Thank you. Steve Sheen. Congress, Congressman, another tough question, uh, uh, one that maybe is of real concern to your constituents, and uh, although slightly less so to people in North Idaho, still a concern, ought to be a concern to everyone, is agriculture. I know you've been spending some time on that issue lately. What, what can you tell us about what's happening in Washington? Well, the Agriculture Committee, of course, is my major committee assignment, and I've worked on that. In fact, this last week, we finished work on a bill that would help the farm credit system. Right now, a, the farm credit system, the Spokane District particularly, is in very, very difficult uh, shape for a variety of reasons. 
uh, the farm credit system approached the Congress and said, help. You know, they need some money. They need some, some uh, financial support if, if the system was going to continue to operate. We passed a bill that included some help for the farm credit system, but also included an amendment of mine, and I'm very pleased with that amendment. It was adopted into the House bill, and it's now part of the House law that was passed that creates a secondary market for agricultural real estate. Right now, if a person wants to buy a farm, he goes to the local bank and quite often has trouble getting credit there for a variety of reasons. Goes to the farm credit system, they're out of money, or goes to farmer's home, and, and you only qualify there if you've been turned down at the other places. Uh, there's not a lot of money for agricultural real estate. My secondary market will allow those small banks in southern Idaho or northern Idaho to provide money and then turn around and sell that on the secondary market, much like they do uh, commercial homes loans. Uh, we think it will do a couple things. We think it will lower interest rates for farmers, and we think it will stabilize land values. Both are extremely necessary if we're going to get our agricultural community back on its feet. Uh, second district is a little harder hit than the first district because obviously that is more important in our district as, as an overall economy than it is in, in the first district. And yet, in talking with some of the folks in this area, I find that they're going through some of the st same strains and pressures. Basic problem, low commodity prices. Everything else would fall into place if they could get five or six dollars for their wheat or uh, five or six dollars for the potatoes. But uh, until the commodity prices go up, then we and the government will have some responsibilities to see that they get credit a little lower and see if we can't uh, help win overseas sales. Both those areas we've been doing very actively in the Congress. It seems that, that agricultural problems are, are uh, uh, sort of cyclical and unfortunately uh, as one segment of the market suffers another one uh, prospers a little bit to beef yes. uh, and some other livestock uh, um, uh, prices are up largely because the cost of production is down because the grain prices are low. Uh, what, uh, what's the long-term outlook for agriculture in the United States and what can, what can Congress do to help the plight of the American farmer? The long-term outlook is, is, depends on whose philosophy you follow. The administration has a philosophy that's very simple. We have too many farmers. If the Department of Agriculture had their way, they would be put in, in, implement some very strict and severe policies that would eliminate farmers. In fact, when uh, the president introduced his farm bill in, in 1985, uh, Mr. Smith from over in Oregon referred to, to it as the Farmer Reduction Act. Uh, they think that if we had a half million farmers, that's all you would need in this country. Right now, there are 2.4 million. Idaho has about 1% of those, or 24,000. If they were to reduce, reduce that number to a half a million, then Idaho, comparatively speaking, would have about 5,000 farmers. And you'd have to ask, how many would that be in northern Idaho? How many in the Magic Valley? You would see, essentially, the end of, of much of rural Idaho. I mean, Boise would still be intact. Twin would suffer. Uh, Idaho Falls, Pocatello would, would take a hit. But uh, the small towns, the Bancrofts and the St. Anthony's, would, would cease to exist. Uh, the Congress, the Ag Committee in Congress, does not agree with that. They feel that we need agriculture. We need a strong agricultural base, and we're trying to provide some programs that will uh, return some profitability. And we're doing a couple of things. Uh, we've got some ethanol uh, legislation that, that could take up a lot of the surpluses. We've essentially forced the administration to sell some of our surplus overseas. And, and as a matter of fact, this last year, the exports have increased. Uh, I'm going to be doing some things in conjunction with the University of Idaho on some alternate crops. Uh, to see if we can't diversify our agriculture a little bit, to get some other crops in this area that may not be traditional. And so we have to take some local initiative. Uh, we're looking at some means of, of adding some value to our crops. We're seeing some potato processing uh, programs take place in southern Idaho. So there's a number of things that, that's happening, but it's very slow. And I know that to the farmer that's in a bit of a tough situation, it seems like it's never coming, and, and for some, in fact, it'll be too late. I know we've got other topics we want to move on to, but I'll just follow up one last time, if I may. What about foreign markets? Are, are they a viable option to former farmers in this area at all? Well, again, you're talking about cycles, and that's the problem with foreign markets. Uh, for the last couple of years, India, for example, has been exporting. All of a sudden this year, their monsoons didn't materialize, and so they will be net importers. The international market, really there are two phases, or two areas. One, those uh, areas like Japan and Taiwan and Korea that that uh, use imports as a club to uh, force their entry into our markets. They've got the money, but they are very selective on what they buy, and uh, they make it difficult to, to negotiate with those people. It's very, very hard. The other group, the hungry nations, don't have the money. And so, although they would like, you know, Bangladesh and some of the African nations would love to buy our food, but they don't have the, the currency, and their own agricultural community says, for heaven's sakes, don't encourage the United States just to give it to us or you destroy our own local industries. And so we're in a very difficult situation. Uh, 
we would like to, and in fact we do make a lot of our food available to those third world and those starving nations, and, and many of them survive because of us. But uh, again, they're, they're short-term solutions. Long-term, it's going to have to be alternate crops. It's going to have to be finding other things to do with our agriculture. Uh, it's going to have to be to find ways of getting the grain to those very, very poor nations that need the food but don't have a lot to trade for it. Thank you. Patrick Rowley. Congressman, um, recently throughout Idaho, there's been an effort uh, spearheaded by Idaho Fair Share regarding uh, House Resolution 1049, the Utility Rate Payer Act. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe just give us some insight on that? I'll give you what little insight I have on it. Uh, we have followed it uh, a bit. Like I said, I, my work recently has been on some of these other issues, so I've not focused on that one. But essentially, this is a bill that would force the power companies to return some of the money that uh, they've been holding back to ratepayers. I believe this is uh, what you're having reference to, that as a result of some of the tax laws that have been passed, that uh, some of these power companies have, have found themselves holding several millions of dollars that rightfully, rightfully belong to ratepayers. Uh, I know that the fair share people have gone out and, and been encouraging members to support uh, that legislation that would essentially force the power companies to, to turn that money back to the consumers, uh, you know, post haste, right, right now. Uh, I don't know where the legislation is. I know that it's being opposed, obviously, by power companies, uh, by some utilities. I know that uh, at th this point, I have not heard a lot from people around the district as to uh, whether that's important. Uh, I know that uh, the various power companies in Idaho uh, are involved in that. How much that means to the individual rate payer or consumer, I don't know. Uh, obviously, the power companies think that they could uh, manage that a little bit better, and if it, if it means a couple of dollars per person, uh, you know, those are just answers I, I do not have clear yet. Congressman Stallings, I would like to get into foreign policy. Yeah. I do this with some hesitation because we're taping this on October the 9th and it won't air till the 1st of November. So I know our viewers will understand if something develops after these uh, answers of yours. There are two really hot spots in the world right now, in the Middle East and our problems with Iran and the shipping and the American flag being host uh, <clears throat> on the ships of other countries. And well, I guess I want to really direct the question too has to do with the role between Congress declaring war and the President acting in uh, areas where there might be conflict. Uh, how do you feel about the War Powers Act being implemented in, in what has happened in the past few days uh, with our problems with Iran? I think you're going to see more and more pressure from Congress to implement the War Powers Act. Now obviously this is going to be resisted by the White House. The problem is exactly what are our goals in the Persian Gulf? Is it to keep the sea lanes open? You know, that's a very legitimate concern, and we have as much right as anyone else in the world to make sure those sea lanes are open. Uh, and obviously the War Powers Act does not necessarily need to be put into action to keep sea lanes open. Uh, but we are in uh, more than that. Uh, we find ourselves in a, in a war that we are taking a tilt towards one of the belligerent powers. In this case, we're, we're supporting, or tend to be supporting, Iraq. And some are saying that our presence there is more to antagonize the Iranians into something beyond just keeping the sea lanes open, that, that in fact we're trying to uh, provoke them to do something foolish so that we can retaliate. Uh, I'm very concerned. I, you know, As long as it's, it's, it's a shipping operation, there's not a problem, but when we start seeing our aircraft fired upon when we see our helicopters being attacked and when we see our people being forced to retaliate and, and take lives, uh, the Congress is going to feel some greater obligation than just to watch a, a shipping operation. Mm -hmm. I would think if this thing continues to escalate, which it seems to be doing, that Congress will just demand that the War Powers Act be implemented and that uh, the clock start and after a certain period of time we either uh, establish some goals and complete those goals or we get out. And I think that uh, that is not in the interest or, or the desires of the administration, but I think Congress has the obligation to, to obey the law and therefore we will be required to do so. The other area, of course, is Central America yes. and the issue particularly over the Contras and aid that the Congress has been dealing with for the last two or three years. I have a two-part question. Part one is what do you think of the recent peace plan uh, that's brought the countries together? And number two, how, what kind of effect will that have on aid from Congress uh, that the President has requested? Well, the, the two questions fit very, very neatly together because we had President Arias before the Congress. Uh, he spoke and did an eloquent job. Uh, he said, give peace a chance. Now, that's what I have been advocating. I voted for contra aid the first year in Congress. We, we provided about 19 million in non-lethal aid. 
uh, the last request, I voted against it, even though it, it was implemented. Uh, I have felt that uh, in the long term, you're going, it's going to cost this country millions and millions of dollars and could conceivably cost lives because $100 million a year will not win that for the Contras. It's going to take much more. In fact, it may take American forces if our goal is to overthrow the Sandinistas. The administration has argued that that is not their goal, to overthrow the, the Sandinistas, just to force them to negotiate. Well, we've now got them negotiating. It seems to me we've achieved our goal. The point is, let's give peace a chance, as Mr. Arias said. Uh, I think that the administration has supported this peace plan because it didn't have any choice. After Mary, Mr. Arias was before the Congress, I think they counted noses. In fact, I think after uh, Mr. North's testimony, they thought there would be an upsurge in, in uh, support for the Contras. That never materialized. And I think that at that point, they decided that if they want support, then they're going to have to rely on Mr. Ortega, uh, Nicaragua, to do something foolish, that uh, they promoted the peace plan, never believing that he would accept it. When he did, he caught them by surprise, and now they're sort of caught with their own rhetoric. Uh, we will support the peace plan in that effort. I don't think Congress will be willing to appropriate any more money unless this happens, unless Mr. Ortega does something very, very foolish. He turns his back on the peace plan. There is some evidence that he's expanding into some of the neighboring countries, or there is uh, some other disaster that his government imposes, such as uh, uh, allowing some offensive weapons from uh, Cuba or from the Soviet Union there. Those kinds of, of things could be disaster to this peace plan and could, in fact, give Mr. Reagan the support he needs to bring in uh, additional money. If the peace plan is given a chance, then I would think Contra support is, is going to be very, very difficult to come by. Thank you. Mary Lou Reed. Congressman, we're asking you to solve all the world's problems in a brief 30 minutes, so I'm going to toss this one at you. What is happening with the deficit? Do you feel that there's any, any movement at all from the sta standpoint of the Congress? Yes, the Congress has been willing to move on the deficit. In fact, we can you know, beat our chest and say we have appropriated less money than this president has asked for in the last five or six years. I know in the three years that I've been there that every appropriation uh, that Congress has, has approved has been, in fact, lower than what the administration has requested. So <clears throat> of the two bodies, I can take a lot of pride in the fact that we've been more responsible than they have. However, that is a very fine line, because when you're talking in terms of, of a trillion dollars of additional debt that this administration has run up, uh, Congress is also guilty of not being uh, very, very fiscally responsible. Uh, you're aware of the Graham-Rudman legislation that we've passed. The whole intent of this was to force this administration to recognize that they cannot have continued military spending at the level they've been asking and responsible deficit reduction at the same time without finding some additional revenues. So Graham Rudman says if we can't come together with a reasonable budget that will fund the military at the level you want and at the same time uh, fund these other programs that both you and the Congress, the President and the Congress are demanding, then the only option would be to cut across the board in which those cuts would fall equally on military programs as well as on social programs. The idea in Congress was that they, the cuts could be severe enough that the president would never want that to happen to the military that he's taken so much pride in. Unfortunately, uh, there is now the guessing that he will let those cuts take place just to show his resistance to any kind of tax increase. Uh, I think that it's a, a tragedy that we're going to go through some very, very difficult times, and yet I think that the Americans have to uh, recognize that uh, if we're going to do some serious things about deficit reduction, it's going to take a much broader base of American support for that. And so far, I don't sense that this, this nation is really committed to deficit reduction. Well, do you think that a tax increase then is inevitable, or do you think that there really are fur further cuts that should be made that can be sold to the people through the leadership of Congress? Congress is, is not a good leader in deficit reduction. We are all fiscally conservative as long as it doesn't affect our own district. Uh, we're all willing to make cuts at someone else's district, and that's one of the real facts of life. We need a strong spokesman. Mr. Reagan could have been one of the great presidents because he had the popularity, he had the national support that he could have asked for the sacrifices, and the American people would have done it. The next president's going to have a tough time making those cuts. Congress cannot raise taxes without presidential support. It's never happened. And as long as this president refuses to look at new revenues, whether we call them uh, user fees or revenue enhancement programs or whatever, as long as they refuse to accept uh, new revenues, then there's no option but to continue to cut programs. That's why I said when I, when I speaking to the students in North Idaho that uh, we're going to have to look realistically 
at less money for student loan programs, at student grant programs, at, at federal funding of education programs, just because there is not going to be additional revenues that I can see coming. The only alternative then is to cut everything, uh, and that will include some of the programs that are so important to this community. Grim. Very grim, yes. Steve Sheen. To follow up on that line of uh, questioning, Congressman, one of the president's uh, political advisors was quoted recently as saying that he thought the door might open to a uh, tax increase if it were combined with spending cuts. Yes. Do you see that as a possible uh, well, compromise? Well, that is, that is the only way that I would support it. I have stated long my three years or four years in this business that I would not support just tax increases. First of all, the president would have to get behind them, and they would have to be masked with, with uh, significant cuts as well. Uh, yes, I don't think that you can just expect the American taxpayers to pick up this cost without some significant cuts. But I think more important, I think that people need to see where the cuts are. And quite often, uh, we always think that there's parts of the budget that you can just chop out because it's obviously waste and fraud. Uh, unfortunately, that's not a light item in the, in the American budget. Waste and fraud just <laughs> exist on its own. And you have to go after every program. We're spending $26 billion in agriculture for 2.4 million farmers. You know, that's a significant amount into a small industry. Uh, that's going to take a hit. And I think that our agriculture community has to recognize that, that we have as much to lose as everyone else if this economy comes apart. And so I think our people are willing to make those cuts, but I think it's going to be required of everyone to make those kinds of cuts. And I think it could have been done better had the president asked for the sacrifice rather than an arbitrary cut that Graham Rudman's going to impose. Let me move to another topic, if I may. Superconducting super collider has got a wonderful ring to it. It's yes. sort of a Buck Rogers appeal, but it also has a tremendous appeal, obviously, to Idaho because of a huge economic impact yes. that it would provide. What's happening in that arena? Well, it is moving. The Idaho uh, Department of Commerce, along with departments of a dozen or nearly 40 states, have submitted sizable applications. Uh, they all make great cases as to why the super collider ought to be in their state. Uh, I've looked at Idaho's and I think it obviously is the best, not that I'm a little biased in this at all, but uh, I really think that in the long term Idaho could build it cheapest and operate it the cheapest uh, and still do quality work. Uh, the question is twofold really, will it be built and uh, where will the funding come from? We're looking at several options. The president says he wants it built but is not showing us where the funds come from. If we have to cut other existing programs then it will never be built. To find four and a half billion dollars in the national science budgets uh, would just create so much animosity and so much opposition that it will not be built. If the president puts together the funds and then gives us the go ahead, I think we could build it and I think uh, Idaho would have a good shot for it. But too many political and financial questions that you still have to be resolved. Cutting across those, um, uh, is, is that a program, and, and, and trying to ignore our own self-interest in this matter, is that a program that's worth four and a half billion dollars? Uh, I think so. I think that we're right on the edge of, of high physics. We've gone as far as we can go given the current uh, equipment. This would lead us into the 21st century and the spin-off would be just incredible in a number of areas. Uh, I think that it has got some potential that, that we're not even thinking about, that the best minds in this country are not, can, can't even contemplate today. So now I, again a bias, that's my committee. I said on the, uh, I was selected to participate in a select task force to investigate science for the next 25 years and it was most fascinating to sit on that committee and listen to Nobel Prize winners from around the world talk about what can be done and what ought to be done. And it is really quite an infectious thing. You get excited, you want to see some things going, but four and a half billion dollars is an awfully lot of money. And when we we're trying to reduce spending, to find that kind of money in this atmosphere is very hard. Patrick Riley. Congressman, um, recently Idaho University and colleges, the enrollment's are way up. Yes. And um, we're going to be expecting a cut back in all student programs. What could be done to, to fund these student programs? We're obviously going to need more student aid for students all throughout Idaho. I understand that the enrollments at all the schools in the state are up dramatically. I know that uh, my institution, Rick's College, they reached about 7,500 this year. And of course, that's a little different situation. They're not uh, worried about much about uh, state and federal programs. They are at the rest of the schools. You've got a couple of options. One, of course, is to lobby the legislature to make sure that they understand where the priorities are and that the, the colleges and universities need adequate funding. Uh, I think, secondly, you need to put pressure on the Congress. I think you need to contact the delegation because there will be, and there are, some significant attempts to reduce the loan and grant programs. And if that, of course, that happens, uh, you're going to see fewer people with the options. Uh, I think that as students, uh, you need to be working with along with the universities and the colleges in the fundraising opportunities because if we had more scholarships available, if there were more people that were contributing money to the universities and scholarships, that would take the pressure off 
the universities to uh, try to get everyone in, enrolled that, that wants to get here. Uh, but I think we also have to recognize that, that we're going into a very, very difficult economic time. Some are predicting uh, essentially economic disasters. I don't think that's going to happen. But there will not be as many federal dollars available. And I think that means that the schools are going to have to look at alternate ways of finding money for their students. I think the state legislatures are going to have to stretch every way possible to make their systems more efficient. And I think that uh, the kids are going to have to perhaps look at a little longer getting through school and, and, and part-time jobs is, a, is not just something that you do for spending money, but in fact to keep you in those institutions. Unfortunately, Congressman, we have left one of the, probably the most complex issue to last with a little time. That happens so often. But the negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union and the arms talks and reduction yes. between Mr. Gorbachev and President Reagan, what do you see as the chances of some significant agreement uh, uh, within the next year, next few months? I think the chances are very good. Now, I'm not sure I'm awfully happy, but uh, you know, we all talk about nuclear reduction, and, and that is a significant uh, thing. I'm nervous that <clears throat> the administration is moving into these talks, seeing the end of their term coming down the pike, and wanting to have accomplished something of great significance. <clears throat> when you work under that kind of parameters, you're not always the best judge of what's right and what's wrong in the long term. Uh, plus, I think the Russians feel that if they can get an agreement from this president, the Senate will be much more inclined to uh, ratify it than if they were to get the same agreement from a President Gephardt or a President Dukakis or, or whoever the Democrat might be. In fact, I would be surprised if you had half the support from the, from the Republicans if a Democrat negotiated exactly the same treaty. In fact, I'm surprised that the Republicans, particularly the conservative wing, are being as quiet about this treaty as they are. Just because Ronald Reagan is, is negotiating it apparently makes it all right. But I'm, I think we're making some concessions here that, that we ought to think through very, very carefully. Uh, we have always assumed, and your, our European allies have assumed, that, that the American umbrella would be there to protect them. You take away all the nuclear weaponry out of, out of Europe, and conventional forces uh, is a tremendous advantage to the Soviets. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry to interrupt. I wish we could pursue that further, but unfortunately time is up on behalf of our panel and our staff. Congressman Richard Stallings, we thank you so much. You've been most informative. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed our program, and I want to invite you to be with us again next week at this same time. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum can be seen at the same time each week over this station. This production was videotaped earlier by an NIC student crew for viewing at this more appropriate time.